reception. I really appreciate each and every one of you, Maddie, Jenny, for being here this evening, Mary, Cooper, who I adopted as one of my mothers, and she has been part of my journey for over 40 years. Greg and Kelly, I want to thank you for your gracious hospitality and allowing me to be here this evening. And yes, Dana is my partner in crime. And it's been quite a journey. I, I grew up very idealistic on the beaches of California. I shared with some of you my story, a little bit of my romantic story growing up there. But I've always believed in one of the early books that I put on my library shelf was The Secret of the Ages by Randy Hall. And I always enjoyed the images that I saw there uh, because in Randy Hall I saw somebody who was trying to, in some fashion, make this world a better place. Recognizing the time that he lived in, and that recognizing the time that Lord lived in, as a very difficult time in our history. Well, we're in a very difficult time right now. And part of my journey has been to explore different traditions. Dan and I have done pieces on the epics of China, on the epics of India, and on the epics of the West. Recognizing that if we truly listen to our stories, we are transformed by our stories. And we have incredible stories. So this fellow, Nicholas Rorick, I didn't actually get to know until about a year and a half ago. A friend said, you really need to stop by the York Museum in New York. I went there, and if you've not been there, I encourage you to put it in your bucket list. Because it's an extraordinary experience where you feel a sense that here was somebody, and I want to say Nicholas and his wife, Elena, because they were a team, who really was attempting, and I was looking through the library, Kelly, I like libraries, and I saw Mandarin Hall's Search for Reality. That's a pretty heavy title for the book, Search for Reality. And I think we're living in a moment now where, to some extent, uh, we have been taught that lies are truth, that ugliness is beautiful, and that evil can be good. And Manley Hall and Nicholas Rourke and Bud Better and, and Penny Besant and, and the gang realized, no, there is there is a quality of reality associated with our existence, which is incredibly important to the manifestation of our gift. So on the one dollar bill, as Daniel was alluding to, I have somewhere here, if you may recall, there is a pyramid on the back. You all recall the pyramid on the back in the eye? This actually came into place thanks to Nicholas Clark back in the early part of the 20th century. And I want to say that that symbol is probably the key symbol to Rourke's work, I think to Manley Hall's work, and to the, Aldous Huxley, to Houston Smith, who was my professor, to Joseph Campbell. Three principles which govern all of reality. One is that we're all related, that there's a unity associated with our existence, that each one of us genetically, biologically, or connected to one another in a way that's very, very intimate. Two, that out of that unity comes this immense diversity, so each part of us human, out of that unity comes this immense diversity that we see all around us, and that anything that pushes against that diversity pushes against the universe itself. And the third principle, is the principle that each of us has a gift. And that in our life, Maddie, our purpose, our happiness, is to express that gift that we've been given. And if we can discover that gift, and we can manifest that gift during the course of a lifetime, through our career or otherwise, we will wind up, as I'm getting to be a little older, quite content in our old age that we've been able to express that gift. So the journey that I undertook about a year ago when I went back to the Rourke Museum is I looked at these paintings and I teach Asian philosophy at the University of Nevada. And it's always an interesting experience because in the first day of class, which will happen in a couple of weeks, I always walk into the classroom and I say, how many of you trust our economic institutions? 
Anybody want to guess how many of the answers over the period of years, which has been hundreds of students, guess how many positive affirmations? You've got it, right? Zero. Trust our economic institutions. Then I ask, how many of you trust our political institutions? Zero. Not one hand goes up. And how many of you trust our religious institutions? And this was the shocker because I look at these kids and I think, well, there's probably some religious folks here. Zero trust our institutions. So we are at the low F mark in civilization. And the thing I will tell you most importantly about Nicholas and Elena Roark is that they were all about civilization and the importance of civilization. Sir Kenneth Clark said in his series on civilization, I don't know what it is, but I know what it looks like. And he points to the Louvre and he points to this piece of art by Michelangelo or that piece of art by Raphael. This is what civilization looks like. And so Rourke and Atlanta did something extraordinary, which we will share in a moment, which I think has transformed all of our lives for the better. And as Dana said, you may not know. So my impulse was, in the East, there's a book called The Oxford Pictures, or a series of pictures, 10 pictures in Oxford and Pictures, which help delineate the spiritual journey. And there are very clear images, which you'll see here in a moment, and what I realized was that we don't have something equivalent in the West. And so I looked at Rourke's pictures and I said, here it is. And so asking him in prayer and in meditation, I got a sense that it was okay to go ahead and use his images to help articulate the spiritual journey. Because as Dana said, his answer to the question of happiness, my path, finding my path. And his whole life was about both an inner and an outer journey or path. And so these are the two incredible individuals. And I want to say that Nicholas Roark is kind of the Indiana Jones of spirituality, right? <laughs> he did it all. He, he went to the Himalayas. He went across the Silk Road. He went across the most difficult deserts, the most difficult mountains on the planet. Why? to try to find some of the answers. I was looking at one of Ledbetter's books up there, which are the three questions I ask my students in philosophy. Whence, why, and whither? Three W's. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? So in his early years, this fellow, Nicholas Rourke, would go out in the backyard. He was born into a somewhat aristocratic family and it had a lot of acreage. And he would dig up mounds, and he would look at the old Viking burial grounds and so on and so forth, trying to discover his roots in Russian history. He was quite the archaeologist. He was one of the earliest members of the Institute of Archaeology in Moscow. And Elena was even more accomplished. She knew, I think, six languages, and she was really the inspiration for Nicholas, because she herself constantly was receiving inspiration. And she had a kind of connection to this inspiration that was constantly supporting the work that they did. So what we want to say at the beginning here, and this is a lovely piece, it's uh, from the Ramayana, and you can see it again in the Himalayas. He was always, during his life, he was enchanted by these mountains. He recognized that the Lamas and the great masters, the Buddha, Confucius, all the great masters were drawn to these mountains. His great symbol was Shambhala. Shambhala is, if you saw uh, Shangri-La, uh, piece done by Hilton in an old movie, The Search for Shangri-La, Shambhala represents that sense that we are moving historically toward a utopian age. We're moving toward a time in which people actually live by the golden rules. They actually care for one another. They actually believe in the principles of truth, and beauty, and goodness, and justice. And so the suggestion is that whether we know it or not, we're all on a journey. We're all on some kind of a path. And the sooner we wake up to it, the better our life is going to be. So one of the first statements I make in my class is, this class is really a game show. And door number one is fear, anger, and anxiety. And door number two is love, joy, and peace. What you don't know is that your birthright is door number two. What you've been told is that you will live the rest of your life with the quality of fear, anxiety, and anger. 
So I tell my students right there in the first week of class, here's your first pop quiz. How many of you want to stay in door number one? Don't raise your hand. See me after class. <laughs> because your birthright is love, joy, and peace. That is your birthright. And so this class and this book, hopefully, is a chance to see the arc of transformation in our lives. And Dan and I were privileged to study with Joseph Campbell and Joseph Campbell's archives at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And Campbell talks forever about transformation and the arc of transformation in our lives. But it requires a journey. And it requires us saying no to door number one and yes to door number two. And that I want to make that pilgrimage. And so these are the Oxford pictures. Again, 10 pictures. This is the first one in the series. And it's basically the recognition that we're on a path, but there are high grasses and tall mountains, and it's a little confusing out there. Anybody notice the confusion out there? Raise your hand. Right? If you don't have any confusion, see me after class. <laughs> I have a good psychologist I can refer you to. It's a difficult world, and it's a difficult journey. And so the first piece is the recognition that we're on a path, and that it is going somewhere, and it's up to us to determine whether or not we can get to door number two. And so a word about these two individuals. Dana gave you a wonderful background about both Nicholas and Elena. Yeah. When he got to Finland after leaving Bolshevik Russia, he realized, good news, bad news, I, I dreamt of going to mountains, but these aren't the mountains I was supposed to go to. The mountains I was supposed to go to are in India. At that time, Russia was regarded as an unfriendly outsider to India. And you may recall that the British were in control of India at the time. And so the British would not let anybody in India who was Russian or background in Russia. Well, fortunately, and this is how reality works, if you follow the path, doors open, and strange meetings occur, like Dana and my meeting. So he's in London. He's left England, and he goes to London, and there he meets with some friends who are from Russia, and he happens across a, a very interesting fellow by the name of Ravindra Tagore who was probably one of the top ten poets ever. And to, he tells Tagore about his dream of going to India. And Tagore has won the Nobel Prize, the first person outside, or I should say non-white individual, to win the Nobel Prize in literature, says, I may be able to help you with that dream. And so Tagore helps him find his way to India. There with his wife, 60 or 70 some horses, they engage the journey across the Himalayas. Now, anybody been to the Himalayas? I've only seen them from an airplane, but it's a pretty amazing place, and it's probably a pretty amazing trek to get across them. But they take their two sons and they go across these mountains and they meet with a number of masters, and during the time of their journey, they're not only outwardly exploring, but they're also inwardly exploring about what is most real. The search for reality. This was his quest. And his quest wasn't just for him and Elena. It was for the planet. He had a planetary vision that perhaps one day we could live in peace. Shambhala. And so he and his wife engaged in this trek and they came back transformed individuals. In 1935, Nicholas Rorick, along with Henry Wallace, along with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, signed the Rorick Peace Pact. And there were 35 nations that joined the President of the United States in signing the Rorick Peace Pact, which was a follow-up to the League of Nations, if you recall the League of Nations. And it was if you will, articulating that in, in addition to creating, if you will, bridges of peace between our nations, we need to somehow value the treasures of our culture, of our civilization. And so he said, I want to, in some fashion, fly a banner, somewhat like the Red Cross, over the cultural treasures of our civilizations, both East and West. And so you see this picture, and it's got three circles in it. 
And those circles stand for truth, beauty, and goodness, or art, science, and religion as institutions. And the circle around those three circles is the circle of love, which you felt to be at the heart of the universe. And so more basically, and I give my students this equation, I say truth plus beauty plus goodness equals love. So Warwick said we should have some kind of banner that, if you will, is flown above these places like the Red Cross is a safe haven for health care. We should have a banner that really uh, honors and celebrates the cultural manifestations of beauty all over the planet. Well, it didn't happen then, but in 1947, the year of his death, a lady named Eleanor Roosevelt started something called UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So you're familiar, really familiar with the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And so this is Nicholas Rourke's legacy to all of us. He said all of these places, and this is one of them, Taj Mahal, he said all of these places Help us to recall that which is most, most important, which is the places of truth and beauty and goodness. Like Kenneth Clark said, I don't know how to define it, but I know what civilization looks like. And so this is the flag, and we see again, truth, beauty, goodness, art, science, and religion as the primary institutions or drivers of culture, surrounded by the circle of love. So Madonna, we all know the name of, and Michelle, or a flame, the golden flame, right? Michelle did a little bit of research on this. The golden flame. The golden flame of truth, beauty, and goodness, and love, as we allow it not only into our culture, but into our lives. And so that, this is why this book that I co-produced with Dana was important to me. Because the question is, how do we allow it into our lives? It requires a journey. And this journey is articulated with a number of Rourke's pictures. And this is the beginning of the journey. And it's the recognition that for all of us, it's a long and it's a windy road. Sometimes we wind up in cul-de-sacs where there's no exit. Sometimes we have to backtrack. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. In our backyard, we have a labyrinth. And the labyrinth is on a hilly slope. And somebody asked me, he said, I've been to labyrinths and they're always flat. I said, well, that's not quite how life is, is it? Sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down. And sometimes you think you're getting close to the answer, and if you've been on a labyrinth, you recognize the labyrinth throws you out to the outer edge very quickly as soon as you start to imagine such fantasies. So the first piece in the journey is recognizing that we need to symbolically leave home. And what does home represent? Home represents those attachments, those material, relational, and ideological attachments that we've grown up with. Right? As Sergeant Joe Cable, I grew up on musicals. Anybody remember Sergeant Joe Cable? He was in South Pacific. South Pacific, right? You've got to be taught to hate. You've got to be taught to hate. Manchester's great Chinese philosopher said, we are not born with hate in our heart. We're born with a quality of goodness in our heart. We are literally taught that door number two place of fear, anxiety, and anger. And so leaving home represents the first piece, and Joe Campbell would suggest that this is the beginning of the journey. The second step is the humble submission to the recognition that we're on a path. And humility, as T.S. Eliot said, is the beginning of the journey and the end of the journey. Without humility, we can go nowhere. And humility, as we learn Sunyata in Buddhism, is the sense that we of ourselves have nothing. As I tell my students, right? Mary, did you go to Jewelers and pick that body out when you were born? No, no. We were given a mind, we were given a spirit, we were given a body. And none of us chose these things. The issue is, what are we going to do with it? And in order to do something with it, in order to manifest that gift that I was talking about earlier, we have to, in some fashion, admit that we are powerless to control our destiny. Yes, we make choices, value-oriented choices, but actually there is a power which controls our destiny. 
and which if we align with that, as Marilyn Hall and Matt Better and the others would say, life works well. I tell my students it's kind of like a shirt. If you get the first button right, it goes down very well. But if you take the first button to the second hole, you've got problems all the way down, right? And so that humble submission, so Jesus said it this way. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. There is the kingdom of heaven. This is the first of the Beatitudes. This is the beginning of the journey. The third step is the recognition that there are values, that truth, beauty, and goodness are real, that love is real. And it was not too far away from here, back in 1972, I was putting in fire alarm systems and living with my Aunt Mary Joy in Pasadena. And I'd just got the word from a friend. He was, a, uh, he was in the Army, he was in Vietnam, and he was walking down a path with his battalion and three children, each with hand grenades in both hands, brushed his battalion. At the end, the children were all dead, his battalion had all been killed, and my friend Lee Benjamin had his leg blown off. It was at that moment that at my Aunt Mary Joy's, she was gone to the beach, I was there by myself, I turned off all the lights, and I basically said, if there's somebody here I need to know, and I need to know now, because the rent's too high down here, and I'm not sure I can continue to pay it. And in that moment, just as we're told in the secret teachings, you ask and you, you shall get the answer. And I did get the answer. And the answer was unconditional love. Every cell in my body was filled with a quality of warmth and a sense of embrace and a sense that unconditional love is the North Star of all of our existence. That is my experience. When we come to appreciate that these values are the most real things in our lives, that compassion and wisdom are the North Star of our existence, and by the way, before I forget, I want to make a plug, a week from Monday in Sacramento, the Charter for Compassion will be recognized by the state legislature of the state of California, California is becoming compassionate California to join 450 communities around the globe who are making compassion their next star. We we'll recognize that compassion should be the filter of our decision making process as we think about our communities. So it's a very exciting time. So again, discerning that North Star, this is really important. And then the fourth step is showing up. I think I was sharing earlier with one of you that in my class. I tell my students, if you want to get an A or a B, the secret is show up. <laughs> show up. And some of them get it, some of them don't. But it's about showing up. And discipline represents not only an internal dynamic, but also an external dynamic. The internal, or the breathe in, is some form of meditation, some form of <coughs> some form of of connecting with a power greater than ourselves within ourselves. I've been meditating for the last 40 years, and it's made all the difference. I tell people that I used to be nervous in Turkey, but I've got over the nervousness. <laughs> I'm working on the other, and I go to the Vedanta Center quite frequently in order to work those kinks out. So again, some kind of internal contemplative practice is the inner piston, if you will, the inner stroke. And the outer stroke is some commitment to some cause, something that you can believe in, something that is worthwhile to serve. And I recognize here at the library you have a lot of volunteers, right, Kelly? And what a pleasure. My wife and I run a clinic, a free medical clinic in Southern Nevada. We have 450 volunteers. And many of the doctors that come to our clinic say, this is the reason I got into medicine. They're, the highest suicide rate right now in the nation amongst the professions is physicians. They're getting burned out. And they're killing themselves because they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. I sometimes in my philosophy classes quote great philosophers, and so I'm going to quote one of the great ones, contemporary, Chris Rock. <laughs> That's not right. That's not right that anybody should be committing suicide. So again, inner dynamic and outer dynamic. My teacher, Thomas Keating, Benedictine monk, 
who uh, started something called Contemplative Outreach, teaching people how to connect with that inner source of power. He says, we're kept from the experience of spirit because our inner world is cluttered by past traumas. As we begin to clear away this clutter, the energy of divine life and love begins to flow through our being. And what we recognize, again, I get the privilege of teaching Buddhism, the first noble truth. There's not one of us in this room, not even you, young Maddie, who hasn't had the experience of trauma in your life, or the quality of suffering in our lives. And so this is the diagnosis. And once you've got the diagnosis, if you're a good doctor, you can begin to go to the healing or the prescription associated with the diagnosis. So the recognition that we've got work to do, as we would call it in Jungian psychology, shadow work to do before we move on, is an important part of this journey. Conversion. So we've all heard about conversion experiences. Uh, I'm very involved in interfaith work in our community. And you may know in the evangelical circles there are bumper stickers which say, I found it. Well, I love the Jewish version of that, which says, I found it, then we lost it, then I found it again, then we lost it, and I found it again. Right? This is what real conversion is. It's the recognition that you're never quite there, but you're moving down the path. And so there are moments, like that moment in Pasadena, where I experienced that marker in my life, which sort of set the course for my life, which allowed me to recognize, as Nicholas and Elena Warwick would say, is that the arc, as Dr. King would say, the arc of history is a moral arc. And that eventually we're going to wake up and figure out, I'm an amateur paleontologist. I tell my students, you know why I like fossils? Because I've been cutting them. Yeah. And in the first week of class, I bring fossils and a tape that's 50 feet long, and we go through the whole history of life. And I tell them, you can't really understand any philosophy unless you understand what went before. And the recognition of what went before is that there are three principles which govern all of evolution. In fact, they govern every science, every philosophy, and every religion. The principles are, again, unity, diversity, and that each one of us is born to become exactly who we were born to become. Each of us has a gift. We call it autopoiesis. And so conversion is the growing recognition of that gift that we've been given and the path that we're on. And on that path, as I suggested earlier, we recognize this door number one stuff. And today we had a retreat for our interfaith council at my home. And all of these, this list of issues that we're currently facing, racism, militarism, uh, all of these different issues that we're facing as society, I said, you know, it's interesting because there's really a theme to all of them. And it's fear. It runs through every issue that we have as a culture. Fear. And I would suggest, as we learn in Buddhism, that anxiety is really fear facing the future. Anger is really fear facing the past. We get angry. Why? Because we get frustrated about things that have happened to us. It's a fear factor. We get anxious because we're fearful about what's coming up. Right? Can we make the payroll? Right, Craig? <laughs> Got to support those nine people, and boy, do we want to do that. But we have those qualities, and as I tell my students, right, and what Family Hall understood in the drawings that I saw earlier appreciated in Indian philosophy, is that this is the material of our animal biological nature. And as a paleontologist, what I share with the students is we have a biological origin, but we have a divine destiny. And this is what Mary Hall and the others understood. We're amphibians, right? We're in the water of biology, but sometimes we get out of that water, and sometimes we hop around and we have a good old time. So again, these are the primary obstacles. Buddha called them poisons. And so I always suggest, would you think of picking up a bottle of arsenic, Kelly, and just downing it with a little ice? No! But every day, we engage in a quality where we amplify these negative emotions in our life. And as I tell my students, actually these aren't too negative, because none of us would be in this room if we hadn't had these qualities, these emotional qualities associated with our evolutionary experience. And so, Howard, I tell my students, you're a winner. You know why you're a winner? Because 3.8 billion years of evolutionary history, and you're sitting in that chair. 
Have they ever reason you're a winner? Anybody know? I know Dana. You know Dana. <laughs> this is even bigger than that. 60 million were going up the tube and you hit the bell. Winner. Hey! Winner. Right. <laughs> it's truly extraordinary that we're even here. And so the only response that we can really have is gratitude. One of my friends, David Stanley Ross, says really the root virtue of all virtues is gratitude. The recognition that we've been given a little time and space on this planet to manifest a gift. What are you going to do with your little bit of time and space? So part of what we need to do is we need to begin to recognize those qualities of fear and anxiety and anger which are in our way. And when we recognize those, we begin to say, those aren't real. What's real is over here in front of two. That's what I learned in my aunt's room that night with all the lights off. I learned that this is reality. This is the answer to where did we come from, why are we here, and where are we go. And so, so much fear and anger and anxiety. Anybody notice? <laughs> it's all over the place. And Ruby has a poem called The Guest House. And I'm going to share this poem because it's really one of those poems. There are a lot of great poets. My Angela who just passed away, bless her soul. So many great poets, Tony Morrison. So many great poets who have touched us, but Ruby is one of those who's deeply influenced my life. And this poem, The Guest House, so just close your eyes for a moment, if you would, and listen deeply. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And I think for me, at 66 years old, this has been the big lesson in my life. When I begin to see that anger, when I begin to see that anxiety, when I begin to see that quality of fear in my life, Instead of suppressing, right, with good Dr. Freud, I saw the books by Dr. Freud up here that Daniel Hall had. Good Dr. Freud said, right, you suppress, you repress, and what? It comes back to haunt you, right? And so instead of repressing or suppressing, we welcome it. We embrace it. We have a movement in Tai Chi. I teach my students, when I teach Chinese and Indian philosophy, I always say, if, I, if I'm not teaching you something practical or something that can make a difference in your life, then throw me and throw the philosophy out the window. So one of the things I do is I teach them a little bit of Tai Chi. And there's a wonderful movement in Tai Chi where we embrace the tiger. We invite the tiger in. And with each of us, whether we acknowledge it or not, we have a quality of trauma, a quality of healing in our life. So typology, the anagram we were talking about there, things like that help us to explore where is that piece that's holding me back? As Thomas Keating says, that trauma that's keeping that sense of unconditional love for my life. Where is it in my life? And guess what? If you look and you notice, you'll find it all over the map as you walk through your days. And so what we recognize is that the temptations, as Thomas Keating and others would say, and it's beautiful because in Buddhism, right, I don't know if you know this, Joseph Campbell helped to point this out, if you go to Buddhism, the Buddha was tempted by the devil. The devil's name was Mara. And there were three temptations. There were the same temptations as Jesus' temptations. What does that suggest? It's what Aldous Huxley, Houston Smith, Marilyn Holly all suggested. This is a universal teaching. This isn't confined to one tradition or another. This is a universal teaching. And so these temptations actually represent that material which we need to move through. 
that shadow material which represents a roadblock in our journey. And so, when he says, turn this uh, stone into bread, anybody recall what Jesus said? Does not live by bread alone, which is a perfect confirmation of the fact that we, yes, we are biological, we do need bread. And it was a lovely dinner at Brown Derby tonight. Thank you very much, Greg. But we do need bread. But we don't live by bread alone, which is to say we're amphibians. We move out of the water of our biological origins toward this divine destiny. This is what Elena and Nicholas fully understood. And that our birthright is love, joy, and peace. And if we're not living with the quality of love, joy, and peace in our life, we're doing something wrong, and we need to ask some serious questions, a little bit of self-inquiry. And as we go along our way, we recognize that everywhere there are teachers, as Rumi's guest house suggests, there are teachers inside of us, and there are teachers here. You are all my teachers. Maddie, you're my teacher. I love the way in which you are excelling in school. I love the way in which you are becoming a wonderful swimmer. I love the way in which you love your mother and your great-grandmother, both of whom take such good care of you, you're a teacher. Each of us is a teacher to one another. And so this word metta, loving kindness, is the recognition that each day we should spend a little time honoring our teachers. And so I have seven buckets. Anybody done loving kindness meditation? I know you probably have. And what you recognize is that everybody's my teacher. So the first bucket is family and friends. Okay, that's a pretty easy bucket. The second bucket is teachers and students, right? That's more. That's a very significant bucket. The third bucket are coworkers, coworkers who are working on this grand work. One of my teachers, Thomas Berry, who spent all of his life thinking about the planet, said we each have a grand work. This is the, the word in alchemy, a grand piece that we're all about. And it's the transformation of this space metal into gold. It's the transformation of our biological nature into this divine nature. And so our teachers are incredibly important, and what we recognize is our students are also our teachers. And so co-workers in the kingdom, people who are out there doing the work. And when I say co-workers, I mean people not only today, but people past, like Nicholas and Elena, like Manley Hall, like Aldous Huxley, like Houston Smith. So the teachers are everywhere. The fourth bucket are the people who I'm going to meet today. People I'm going to go out, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven, I'm going to go someplace, and I'm going to do some kind of transaction. How am I going to treat that person? Martin Gruber said there's only two ways in which to treat people. You can either treat them as a thou or a hit. The other day I was having lunch, she came to our town, and I said, I'd love to host you for lunch, so Mary Ann Williamson came, and we had lunch. And she thought, because she was in Las Vegas, that she was speaking to an audience. She says, you know, I feel very good about the sex work industry. And right next to me on the other side was a, a lady named Ayub, who actually was sex trafficked as a teenager. And I looked over at Amy, she looked at me, and our jaws were dropping. And I explained to Mary Ann this idea of I, thou, I, it, that Martin Buber had suggested. And I said, Interesting thing about Martin Buber's statement is he said, when you treat people as a transaction or as an it, guess what happens to you? You lose your meaning. You become an it. So the, the, the crime of prostitution or sex work is the devaluation of another human being. And so I turned to Mary and I said, Mary, you have a little bit of background in Judaism. She's Jewish. I said, where is the thou in sex work? And I heard that two weeks ago she was giving a talk and there was a group there and they were asking her questions about sex work and she says, I'm currently reevaluating my position on that subject. <laughs> so there are teachers everywhere. So that's the, that's the fourth bucket. The fifth bucket are the people with whom I have tension. These are my teachers. So again, what I recognize is sometimes I don't have tension 
toward Dana, but Dana may have tension toward me because I've not responded to an email that he sent <laughs> two hours ago. <laughs> no, not true. Dana's a very patient and kind individual. But again, there are people that have tension toward us. We may not have tension toward them, but I want to bless them all. I want to recognize them as my teachers. And the, the sixth bucket that I use at this loving kindness meditation is the recognition that there are people all over the planet, so it's everyone on the planet. Everybody on this planet is suffering. Everybody is experiencing trauma. So it's that global appreciation of every section of personality. And the last bucket is all those who have gone ahead. All the ancestors. Without whom, right, we wouldn't be here, right? I'm a little schizophrenic because my uncle, the house that I was staying in, he did our family tree. And when he went back, he discovered that Henry Jameson was setting up cannonade in Boston Harbor to shoot on the British fleet. And he discovered that the other side of the family was a fellow named Admiral William Howe, who was commanding the British fleet and getting the hell out of Boston Harbor. So I'm a little schizophrenic. We all have an amazing family tree, amazing stories that are inherent in our DNA and are part of who we are, and we should honor and thank that lineage. And so we recognize that we're part of a sangha. This, and I, I'm not I'm surprised to say I've not been to this library before, but I'm thrilled by this library. It's, I love books. I love old books. USA Today did a study on books, and I was pleased to read that they actually discovered 83% of all the people who responded to their questionnaire said they want a book in their hand. Right? We have all these Kindles and e-books and so on and so forth, but I like the book in my hand. How about you, Mary? Absolutely. And so we recognize that the next piece is that we have a fellowship. Some of that fellowship we know. We know the people who are Dana's part of my sangha, part of my fellowship. But there's an unseen fellowship. And so I just met a couple members of my unseen fellowship, Kelly and Greg, and I'm meeting all of you here tonight. Frank, right, who spent some time over at the Nazi Center. Every time I come to LA, I sort of try to scurry past all the traffic and get to the Nazi Center so I can do a little meditation and chill. It's always a lovely experience there to be in that place where all the Sakshi and Christopher Ishiro and the gang, Father Bananda, were teaching. And so it was one day in one of my classes, a student came up, she said, I want to take you to thank you for that teaching on some on divine fellowship. I said, what for? She said, well, after you gave the lecture, I realized that I was being invited out onto Lake Mead by an individual who had a very nice boat, very fancy boat, and that, in fact, there was going to be alcohol and drugs on the boat, and that, in fact, he was not bringing his wife, he was bringing a mistress. And she said, I realized that was not my sangha, that was not my fellowship. Long story short, the boat hit one of our rocks at 2 a.m. and everybody on the boat, except for the captain, was killed. So we say, right, that finding our tribe, finding our, our group who shares that sense that values are real, that love is the most real thing in the universe, it is the very fabric by which the universe is guided. I saw an image of Pythagoras, right, who said that the spheres, are, if you will, filled with music. They're filled with truth, which he called numbers. And they're filled with the quality of goodness. This is the very fabric of the universe. And if we work with that fabric, like the button on the shirt, things work out pretty well. If we don't work with it, we tend to bump our head against the wall. Once too often. I have a friend who said he realized after calling an attorney, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here, but after calling an attorney 150 times and feeling bad every time he called the attorney, that there was a connection between calling attorneys and feeling bad. <laughs> We're a little slow as biological creatures, but eventually we'll get it, right, Mary? <laughs> and so find your tribe. This is part of the journey, is to find our tribe, to recognize there's a group out here and it's an ever-expanding circle of, of individuals who share these aspirations. 
along with Nicholas and Elena, who recognize that someday the planet will live in peace and light, and that we can contribute to that. We can do our little part. So again, we're here for some 70, 80, 90 years, just a brief moment in the pantry of time. Right? That 50 foot tape of four and a half billion years of Earth history that I showed to my students. The dust on the end represents all of recorded human history. All of this is just the dust on the end of that 50 feet. So we can ask ourselves, what have we learned? And what do we need as individuals and as a society or community to do? So one of his most famous paintings is of the Mother Universe, of the Great Mother. And there you see this sense that the universe is embraced by a motherly spirit. And what we recognize from Maria Gubatis and a number of people who have done the archaeological work is that if we go back in time, we recognize that the mother spirit of Gaia was the progenitor of all civilization. It wasn't the father spirit, it was the mother spirit. Why? Because we're so closely connected to the earth. And so this recognition that we are embraced by the feminine. Lao Tzu says, can you become, can you open your window, can you open your gate to the feminine? It was after 9-11, and I told you that I, in my class I do a lot of crazy things, but we, we did the I Ching. How many of you are familiar with the I Ching? So we threw the coins, and right after 9-11, You'll never guess what I got. I've never had this sense. We got a full yin. Anybody know what a full yin means? Every one of the lines. So a hexagram, six lines, broken lines, full yin, which means full feminine. What do you think that means after an event like 9-11? Anybody? Receptive. 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 Right? We touch you, we say, step back. Listen. We didn't do that. We did it for just a brief moment, but we didn't do that. And so again, what we recognize is that the Mother Spirit, along with the Father Spirit, are these qualities of energy which govern the universe. And that we must, in some fashion, recognize that the feminine aspect of our psyche is emerging right now in a way that she's never emerged before, and that we must listen to this call because this is the mother nature. Don't mess with mother nature, or you may get a, a, a several degree hike in your temperatures. You may begin to see polar bears finding no ground to walk upon, no food to eat. One of my interfaith friend Thomas Wendell said, walk softly on mother earth for a she who supports you. So these are the lessons. That and Nicholas and Elena fully understood. And that service, real service, meaningful service, dedicated service, is essential to the journey. This is the outbreak, the in-breath, the outbreak. One of the people that my grandmother spent time with in Africa, Albert Schweitzer, said, constant compassion and kindness can accomplish much. As the sun makes ice to melt, Compassion and kindness causes misunderstanding, mistrust, and hostility to evaporate. His, his motto, anybody know Albert Schweitzer's motto? Reverence for life. Reverence for life. The recognition that all life is sacred. All life deserves our respect. And his move to Africa many regarded as a move of insanity because he was one of the great physicians of Europe, he was one of the greatest theologians and philosophers of Europe, and when he went to Africa to open up a medical missionary, a free clinic in Africa, in the heart of Africa, many regarded as that a moment of insanity on his part. But he was really paving the way as Nicholas and Lena have done for us. He said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will really be happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. This is our clinic in Southern Nevada. We provide access to people who have no access to health care, dental care, and mental care. Last year we saw 8,000 people 
and gave away over $3 million in free meds and over a million dollars in free diagnostics. And these are people, and the reason my wife and I started this clinic was because the coroner was tagging these individuals as natural deaths. They would have a diabetic coma at the age of 30 or 35. They would have a cardiac arrest at the age of 40. And again, quote that great philosopher, Chris Rock, that's not right. That's not right. And so we said to ourselves, those aren't natural deaths, those are preventable deaths. And that healthcare should be a right. There's a responsibility along with healthcare, you have to take care of yourself. Eat some good fruit, right, Mary Cooper? Mary Cooper has been my fruit guru for 40 years. She makes the best fruit salads on the planet, right, Jenny? Right, Maddie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so again, we learn that there's a venue, there's a, a avenue for the stage of us, and that's where we find the manifestation of our gift. And so during the journey, what we experience over time is a growing sense of intimacy. As Dana said about our relationship, when we first met, we were kind of strangers. But then we said, well, he's not all that bad. <laughs> And then I began to recognize his talents, and we began to share stories. We began to recognize that maybe there's a friendship here. And that friendship has now emerged into a sense of, this is my brother. And not just my brother here on planet Earth, but my brother all the way through what I call the universe journey. Mary and I were having a talk about this. I regard the universe as a university. And I regard each of us as bubble bees, and we'll go from star to star, from planet to planet, gathering nectar, learning, growing, evolving our soul. But we've done a little bit up down here, but we've got a lot more to do. And we'll be doing this for a very long time. And I regard you as one of my companions on that journey. And you too, and your husband, Richard, who I, we will both be seeing not too long from now. So growing intimacy and union. A sense of being at home in the universe. A sense that the universe is friendly that the universe cares for us, and in fact, that there are more unseen beings, right? I believe then they all believe this, more unseen beings on this planet than there are of us. Well, we ask the question, we scratch our head, well, why aren't they solving all the problems in Washington, D.C., and Carson City, and Sacramento, and all the different places? Well, they need our hands, and they need our feet, they need our hearts, they need our minds. They recognize and they honor free will. And so the journey is a journey toward union, a journey toward connection, intimate connection with that divine, indwelling presence within each of us, the most significant aspect, the most real aspect. I would say the greatest of all facts, the most real of all ideals, the most friendly of all friendships is that inner quality that resides within us. That was affirmed to me that night in Pasadena long ago. And that we recognize that doubt is just a movement from one room in the house to another. It's just a transition. We have great fear and we've done great things with all of our cemeteries so and so forth. I'm a little bit like a Scrooge on that, like bah humbug, waste of real estate, right? I told my wife, when I die, I want to I want to become what I've always aspired to be, an ash. <laughs> And so it is just nothing more than a transition. Again, like bees moving through the garden, we move through this universe. And so the journey is an eternal journey, it is infinite, we are all alive, and the sooner we recognize that, and again, I, I hope you've seen tonight, and again, I did, Dana kind of filled in a little bit of the biography of Nicholas and Elena, so I'm going to let you read his books. I've got several in the back there. There's one that really articulates his spiritual, their spiritual journey in a wonderful way. But I hope you've seen in his heart, inspired by his wife, Elena, that this was a visionary. This was a man and a woman who recognized where we're going, why we're here, and where we come from. And so I hope tonight, in our few moments together, you've been given a little bit of the inspiration of this Incredible soul, Nicholas and Elena Rourke. Again, recognizing, as I tell my students, right, it was just a few years ago up on the mountains here that a fellow named Edwin Hubble looked up through a telescope and he said, My goodness gracious, do you know that there are a lot of stars out there? 
And in fact, there's something called the universe. And what we recognize now is that there's probably a trillion galaxies, each galaxy having somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 300 billion stars, ours just being one of those. So you do the multiplication a trillion times, right? 100 to 300 billion stars. Do you think there's life out there? Do you think this adventure is eternal? Well, everyone that I've seen here on the shelves here, from the Bhagavad Gita to the Upanishads to Ledbetter to Annie Vasant to Manly Hall, they all say absolutely yes. So this is where we are right now. I always bring this one up in my last, my next to last class in philosophy at the university. It's, you may recognize the scream, and it's a moment of fear and trembling. It's a moment of darkness. In India, we call it the Kali Yuga. It's a moment in which there is this opportunity of an actual drama, which is a switch, which is a sudden switch. And what I see going on here, and I see it all across the planet, 450 communities. I, Karen Armstrong asked me to be part of her Charter for Compassion, so I serve on that board of the Charter for Compassion. 450 cities. We are doing something called Compassionate Integrity Training, right? Which, if you're interested, I'll send it over here, and it's a three-day course. It's basically teaching people how to be compassion trainers, how to spread the benign virus of compassion into our communities. And as Buddha said, compassion is the wisdom of the heart, and wisdom is the compassion of the brain. And this is our journey, this is our destiny. So, again, the journey is from monkey, right, from biological roots to a divine destiny. And the question is, are we ready for the journey? It's an endless journey of discovery and wonder. And my family and I thank you. This is my wife and my two children. My son on the left is now my daughter, transgender a year and a half ago. And again, what I learned in that little room there in Pasadena, it's unconditional love all the way up and all the way down. I don't really understand it, but she's in my heart. Now I have two daughters. Oh, blessed to I. So, namaste. Thank you.